All right, all right, all right. Tulips, not native to North America, or Central America, or even South America. So, okay, you're realizing that tulips don't do bupkis for our beautiful North American pollinators, and you're hoping to rip out those useless ecological deadweights and replace them with some beautiful native flowers that are similar to tulips. Allow me to help you with that. Step one, take a mow, figure out what it is you like about tulips. This will help you decide the best replacement from my list. Is it that they come up early? Is it their bright colors? Is it that they're singular flowers, which is to say one flower on each stalk? Or maybe it's just that you like bulbs because they're so damn easy to plant. So these are the different native flowers that we're going to talk about that are going to be your replacements for tulips. And I have them organized based on what their similarity is to tulips. Do keep in mind that the only tulips are tulips. No native flower is going to be a perfect match. Also keep in mind that the tulips we get these days are hybrids anyways. They aren't even the original kind of tulip. All right, so let's get ourselves to some realistic native flowers that actually do something for bees and butterflies, and therefore giving you a beautiful pollinator show to watch. We're going to start with flowers that are the closest match to tulips, at least in my opinion. They come up early, they're red or brightly colored. So this first one here is Trillium erectum, or commonly called red trillium or purple trillium. And it comes up early. It's this nice sort of reddish color. It blooms for three weeks, which is nice. Over many years, it will form these really nice clumps, which is also nice. Um, <clears throat> in some states, red trillium is endangered, threatened, or vulnerable. So picking this as your um, tulip replacement is a really nice choice. The only piece of the puzzle here, though, that I really must tell you about is that red trillium has an unpleasant odor, and that is because its primary pollinators are actually carrion flies and carrion beetles. So many people will tell you it kind of smells a bit putrid. <laughs> actually, uh, red trillium was once used to treat gangrene because people thought the putrid smell of gangrene is similar to the smell of this flower same smell so obviously the flower can treat gangrene it didn't work um, and I have smelled red trillium now and I don't find it to be the most foul smell uh, so you know I don't think it's so bad and you can't smell it from across the yard or anything it's not like someone gets within half a mile of your house and they go oh my gosh so you, you kind of have to be a little close to it uh, so that's the news there this next one is called Trillium recurvatum, or prairie trillium. Now that is a misnomer. Uh, it's not really found in prairies so much as wooded areas. So wooded areas with light shade, maybe partially damp. Um, it's a pretty decent native flower to look like a tulip, right? It's a singular flower like that red trillium. Um, it's got this dark wine red sort of color. Uh, there's really pretty mottled leaves, which is nice to see. It blooms around the same time as Virginia bluebells, which are native. And I only mention that because prairie trillium and Virginia bluebells would look very beautiful planted together. Anyways, um, prairie trillium is really long lived but it can start very slowly. It can take up to 10 years to bloom the first time from seed. So if you are interested in getting prairie trillium and having it bloom like now, you might wanna not buy it from seed, but buy the actual plant. And once it does start growing and blossoming, it increases slowly by underground roots uh, so it will make these nice patches, just like that red trillium. It doesn't, this underground roots, it doesn't spread wildly or quickly, so I wouldn't worry about that. Uh, just like the red trillium, prairie trillium is uh, endangered in some places, such as Michigan. Uh, there are several other states where it is watched or rare. Now, on the whole, the species is considered secure 
in our country, um, but there's a few places where it's not doing so great. So next up, I have this purple poppy mallow, purple poppy mallow, purple poppy mallow, Calero involucrata. So these are sometimes called wine cups. You can probably see why. Uh, it's a really beautiful color, right? And so um, this, these are a nice sized flowers and they're a nice bright color like tulips, but they're not quite as singular as tulips. The flowers open each day and close at night. So that makes for a really long bloom period and it's a neat trick. Um, and this foliage it has, um, along with the flowers, spreads really slowly and makes these, uh, it can make a dense ground cover. And it is prized for its ability to gracefully drape uh, over maybe like the side of a retaining wall or over some rocks. I don't know if you've ever seen people who have flowers that are like draped over a stone wall and you think, how are they doing that? Well, purple poppy mallow. <laughs> Another um, native flower that can do that is phlox. I'll uh, put that in the video description below, that name, phlox. But here, purple poppy mallow will do that for you. Um, <clears throat> it likes depleted, gritty, dry soil, uh, and it likes full sun, which those usually go hand in hand, right? And it has a very long taproot. So this makes it really resistant to drought, but it does make it also difficult to transplant. So once you've decided where you want it, uh, you're probably gonna wanna keep it there. So here we have Columbine, Aqualasia canadensis. And besides being an early bloomer, Columbine um, is fine with a large range of soil and sun types. So that makes it really, um, it's nice because you can grow it in a lot of different areas and it will do just fine. Um, a lot of these red flowers, especially from here on in, uh, hummingbirds really like red flowers. So this columbine, like a lot of other red flowers, brings in hummingbirds, which is of course beautiful to see. Um, but it also brings in bees and butterflies. Columbine is the larval host plant of a couple butterflies. And what that larval host plant means is we usually just think of the grown-up butterflies, like the pretty flapping <laughs> butterflies. Uh, but we can't forget about the whole life cycle, right? Butterflies lay eggs. They have caterpillars, all that. So a larval host plant like columbine means there's a couple kinds of butterflies that will only lay their eggs on this plant, on these leaves. Uh, and then those little eggs will hatch and the caterpillars will eat these leaves. So it's a part of the butterfly life cycle. Next is fire pink, uh, Silene virginica. So fire pink likes rocky, sandy, dry clay, rocky slopes, dry open meadows. It's a bit uh, drought tolerant, which is nice. Uh, it is a relative of the royal catch fly, if you're familiar with that. Um, but it blooms earlier. In fact, for, to my eyes, the difference between fire pink and royal catchfly, I almost can't tell a difference, except this fire pink blooms earlier and royal catchfly blooms later. I will show you royal catchfly. Um, so these bright red and pink flowers attract hummingbirds, which you can guess because they're red, uh, and they bloom for a month or longer. So that's really nice, that nice long bloom time. But it is a short-lived perennial. So what this means is it comes back from year to year, but after maybe three or four years, it's kind of donezos, <laughs> which means it's done. <laughs> um, so you need to let it self-seed. So when it gets pollinated, which it will, uh, and it makes its little seeds, let those seeds drop and let it have, you know, first year fire pinks coming up, second year, third year. And that way you'll just sort of have a little patch of fire pink that's constantly coming up and blooming. Um, and as older ones die back, you've got younger ones that are still going to be blooming for you. Like I said, it attracts hummingbirds, but you'll also see butterflies. And those seeds, which you should let drop, they will also attract a whole bunch of different kinds of birds. So that's always a show. Um, it is widespread, but it's also relatively uncommon and rare at the edge of its range. Okay, so next I have for you three different kinds of shooting stars. For starters, I just love the name shooting star. <laughs> this first one is the Midland shooting star, Dodecathean media. 
um, <clears throat> this can become very robust and have several dozen flowers coming out of each plant. So that is beautiful. Um, it's a true uh, prairie ephemeral, meaning it will bloom, but it, by summertime, the whole thing is completely dormant. There's no foliage or anything left. Bumblebees are the main pollinators of all these shooting stars. Um, and the bumblebees use buzz pollination. <laughs> so buzz pollination is is neat. You know, when the bumblebees are in there, they buzz, and this um, shakes the pollen out. So that's good for them, but it's also good for them pollinating other flowers. So buzz pollination is very cool. Midland shooting star is also, can be difficult to grow from seed. So... It's another one of those that you may be interested in buying the actual plant instead of growing it from seed or just accept that it'll be a little rough growing it from seed. But once you finally got it, you got it. And so the next one is the southern shooting star, Dodecathean pulchellum. Um, and so, you know, to be quite honest with you, the difference between this one and the last one is this one maybe likes things a little more partially shaded while the midland shooting star maybe prefers a little more sun the southern shooting star likes moisture a little more in the soil while the midland shooting star likes it maybe a little more dry so a lot of these shooting stars they look very similar to my eyes but the difference between them um, in practice would mostly be <laughs> where you can grow them and so this last one is the amethyst shooting star or jeweled th shooting star, Dodecathean amethystinum. Um, <clears throat> also, you know, very fragrant. It's an ephemeral, meaning it will bloom and have foliage, but then by summertime that will all die back and there'll just be nothing there, <laughs> except underground, of course. Um, <clears throat> so it is restricted uh, this one to mostly limestone hills and valleys of the Midwest, uh, some stream banks, and there's sort of a disconnected population of it uh, in the Appalachian region. So it is a plant that is uh, actually of concern, although it's not endangered. Um, it's tough because this amethyst shooting star, it has actually a very small range as it is, and then some of that range is um, disrupted, making it a little harder to find. So it's not endangered, but it's not particularly common to find either. Um, but this amethyst shooting star, unlike the other ones, it's okay with um, any light that you will give it. And it's pretty medium in the soil moisture that it wants. So kind of in between the other two. Okay, so let's move on to some tulip replacements that are early bloomers, if that's what you love about tulips, but these are not particularly brightly colored. You don't look at them and go, wah, like you do with a tulip. So this first one is sharp-lobed hepatica, or hepatica acutiloba. And this one is considered by many to be the very earliest bloomer of the year, the very first one to come up. You can see bloom times can be as early as February. So that's amazing because at that time of year, you're tired of winter <laughs> um, and it's the plant that keeps on giving all year long because it has these nice red leaves in the fall and uh, it's called sharp lobed hepatica and if you're a medical person you will hear hepatica and you'll think of liver and it is named uh, because the leaves are liver shaped one source I read indicated that it was harvested to near extinction at one time in our country's history because it was believed to heal liver problems due to its liver shape. This did not turn out to be true, but anyways, uh, that's why hepatica is in its name, uh, that leaf shape. So here we have large flowered bellwort, or Uvularia grandiflora. Um, it makes these nice little clumps um, with this beautiful yellow flower, but it's not quite as showy, right? It's not, um, it doesn't immediately pop out at you, but it is beautiful. Uh, and it does come up early, as you can see, in April or May. Um, and after they bloom, the greenery of it will stick around all summer. This last little one is this yellow trout lily, which comes up anywhere from March to May, um, Erythronium americanum. This yellow trout lily, so it's pretty short. 
it's only it's not going to be more than a foot tall uh, mostly when i see them they're only like half a foot tall maybe but it's a beautiful bright yellow um, it is truly an ephemeral meaning it will bloom for a very short time just a few days um, and it can form these nice little clumps that will take a few years to fully form and it is a gentle and delicate flower um, but the thing that's sort of neat about it is it comes up so early, those early spring rains, the yellow trout lily captures a lot of the nutrients that will run over the land uh, with that water. And it will capture all these nutrients, put it in, put those nutrients in the yellow trout lily leaves. And then around summertime, when the whole plant is gone, all those leaves drop off, those leaves act to fertilize the soil and all of your summer flowers that are now starting to bloom. So it's a delicate little darling, but it has a pretty robust purpose, the yellow trout lily. Okay, so now we have things that are red, or bright but are not early bloomers they're late bloomers but if it's that bright tulip red you love I've got some things for you here so this first one and it's honestly it's a personal favorite a uh, red bee balm Minarda didyma oh my gosh favored by pollinators favored by me <laughs> highly attractive to hummingbirds which you can guess from its red color it is the larval host plant to a few different moths so again, that larval host plant means that, um, in this case, these moths um, will land on the leaves of red bee balm, lay their eggs, and when those eggs hatch and become caterpillars, those caterpillars will eat the leaves. So circle of life here, we got to care about the little babies as well as the adults, right? Um, <clears throat> red bee balm does like well-drained soil. It can spread rapidly. Now, I appreciate this with red bee balm. I love it so much. Please spread anywhere you want. Um, but that is something to keep in mind. Um, it is in the mint family. So you can get kind of a minty smell from it, especially if you crush those leaves. Um, and as a sidebar, I guess, um, that bee balm, there's a lot of different types of bee balms. Uh, not just the red bee balm, but that uh, name is in reference to a former use of this plant. You can crush the leaves or the little resin that's in it can soothe bee stings. So bee balm. Okay, so this next one is royal catchfly. So you'll remember before I showed you fire pink. This is royal catchfly. They're very related. Um, Silene regia is this. Um, so royal catchfly is not often seen anymore because of habitat lost, and it is threatened or endangered in most places that it's found. Ouch. Uh, just like all the other red tubular type flowers, it is highly attractive to hummingbirds and butterflies. Um, it does attract, so this is interesting and in why it's called catchfly, it does attract small insects and releases enzymes that actually breaks those insects down so it's a defense against bugs eating the leaves and the plants so that's neat it's a little taller than that fire pink and it blooms later than the fire pink otherwise they look very similar it has a deep tap root which means it's hard to move once you have established it but it also makes it a little more drought tolerant okay so this next one is the cardinal flower and just like royal catchfly and fire pink, the three of those all look really similar to me, and that includes this cardinal flower. Um, but cardinal flower likes medium wet to wet moisture. So if you're in sort of a wet place and you see something that looks like one of these, it's probably cardinal flower. Um, <clears throat> even though cardinal flower looks like royal catchfly and fire pink, it's actually not quite as closely related as you might think. Being that it's red, you can bet your butt that it attracts hummingbirds, also butterflies. Um, it's a perennial, meaning it'll come back for many years. Uh, and then it might end up dying out. However, uh, just like with that fire pink, um, if you allow the seeds that it makes to drop, just let the seeds do their thing, um, it is able to maintain a nice little clump for you all on its own. You just have to allow the seeds that it makes to drop, let it self-seed, uh, and then you can kind of keep a little clump going. Inter interestingly, um, so a lot of the non-native species that are here in the United States uh, obviously got here from other countries. People thought they were neat and they brought them here. Well, this cardinal flower is a bit of a reverse on that. 
Um, native here, it was introduced over in Europe in the 1620s, um, and it picked up the name cardinal flower because the red of the flower matches the red uh, robes that the cardinals wear in the Catholic Church. Cool. So here we have butterfly weed, Asclepius tuberosa. Now, if you know what's what in this world, you'll know that butterfly weed is a type of milkweed. It's the only milkweed and actually one of the only native flowers that is orange. Um, <clears throat> but the fact that it's a milkweed means that monarch butterflies both come and visit this plant, but they will also lay eggs on the leaves. Now, just to be fair to you, um, butterfly weed is not the favorite uh, milkweed of, of monarchs, um, but they will come to it. Um, and I have butterfly weed here because of its brilliant orange color when it's in bloom. It's a nice bright color, uh, similar to a brilliantly bright tulip, right? Uh, it's perennial. It'll keep coming back for a long time. It self-seeds, so you can let those little seeds just drop, and then you kind of end up with a nice little clump. Um, and for all of these, um, when I say nice little clump, it won't spread like crazy. It, it just makes a little clump, and it's quite nice. Um, it looks bush-like. However, the entire, what we'll call bush, uh, it dies back every year in the fall and winter. So most bushes we're familiar with are there all year. Um, if you want to call butterfly weed a bush, um, which is not entirely appropriate, but it does look kind of like a bush, but it'll all die back all the way down to the ground um, in fall and winter. Okay, so for these last two, if your interest in tulips is that you love a bulb, you just love that you just plop that bulb in the ground and up it comes in the spring, so easy. I have two native flower bulbs for you, um, and I love a bulb too. So this first one um, is Dense Blazing Star, Liatris Spicata. Um, and I, I lied to you already. Uh, <laughs> this one and the next one, they're not actually bulbs. They're called corms just to make you sound smart. But the truth is, and they, this corm, they look a little different than a bulb, but for the purposes of you and me, a corm is basically the same thing as a bulb. Uh, it's just shaped a little different. And I do love me a corm. It is so easy. You just bury them in the ground, just like a bulb in the fall, and voila! Uh, in the case of Dense Blazing Star, it comes up in the summer, and there's your plant. So easy. So they are perennial, they'll come back every year, and with time they make these pleasing clumps. Um, and in the fall time, if you want to break apart any of these clumps, you just dig up some of the corms. You can break them apart a little bit, or they kind of naturally come apart, and then you can just plant those corms somewhere else. Uh, the foliage on these things is reminiscent to me of the non-native grasses that people like to plant in their yards. The non-native grasses that are like four to six feet tall that form these little clumps. Uh, Dense Blazing Star looks a lot like those to me, except you get an amazing flower on it. Um, and so I think this Dense Blazing Star is actually even a nice exchange for stupid non-native grasses too. Uh, lots of pollinators visit bees, butterflies, even hummingbirds, uh, moths at nighttime. And in the fall, I have definitely seen birds coming to eat these seeds. And so it's just, it's a show. It's, I love it. Dense Blazing Star. And so the next one is another blazing star. This is called Meadow Blazing Star, Liatris ligulostylis. Now this is my absolute favorite blazing star multiplied by a million. I don't know of a better monarch butterfly magnet than this one. I mean, you plant a meadow blazing star, you will get monarch butterflies. I can almost guarantee it. <laughs> you plant it, they will come. End of story. So it's also a corm just like the dense blazing star. So you just pop that corm in the ground in the fall time, and then in the summer, up comes up metal blazing star. Uh, just like the dense blazing star, the metal blazing star attracts a lot of pollinators. You can see birds and finches eating the seeds in the fall time. Um, these little blossoms on it, they're like these little tufted blossoms. They look Dr. Seuss-like to me, <laughs> which I adore. Uh, and... I mean, to be perfectly honest, I'm a sucker for all of these blazing star plants. I love the corms. I love the colors, the blooms, the pollinators they attract. You just can't go wrong. Um, except, of course, make sure the sun and the soil moisture are correct. 
All right, you native flower loving plant people, you've got some solid options here for things to exchange out your tulips for. And they are less work than tulips because they come back year after year, unlike those tulip bulbs, which you have got to keep planting every year. Um, and whether it's the early bloom time of the tulips you like, their striking color, the fact that they're a singular flower, or just that they're a cool bulb, I got you covered in this list. So pick something from this list and try it out. See what you think. So when you try out one of these delightful native flowers, do be sure to use the scientific name when you're searching for a place to buy them from. So the common names of plants get misused and misunderstood between various people and companies and websites a lot. So if you stick to the scientific name, you'll be doing a lot better to be getting what you think you're getting. Um, and absolutely steer clear of hybrids and cultivars. Just get the real deal native flower. Some of these plants, like the dense blazing star I showed you, you can buy corms that are hybrids, that they're, they're white blazing stars instead. Don't do it. Don't do it. It's not the same to the native pollinators. So just stick with the real deal stuff, baby. And so Prairie Moon Nursery and Prairie Nursery are two online nurseries that I really trust. Uh, all their flowers are native. There's no hybrids. They're raised and mailed to you properly. I don't get any sweet deals for saying nice things about these two nurseries, but I do want to help you find good places to get your sweet native plants from. So in the video description, I have all the common names and scientific names of these flowers, <clears throat> as well as links to the two native plant companies I trust. So come on, ABC man, always be cool, which in this context means plant native flowers man. <laughs>